I now have the pleasure of introducing a panel that's really central to any discussion on humanitarian action. The next session is called Funding a Healthier World When Human Rights Drive Decisions. And it's going to be moderated by Foundation President and CEO Peter Lahern. The session is going to take a look at what it takes to fund a healthier world with human rights centering decisions. Given that the prize is going to One Acre Fund just after this panel discussion, this discussion is also going to look at lessons that other sectors, like agriculture, can learn from that of global health financing. We hope for the discussion to focus not only on the challenges and the barriers that limit this approach to funding, but also on the successes that can be shared as examples to emulate. I'm going to let Peter introduce the panelists. They're all experts in their field. So please join me in welcoming to our stage Peter Lawhorn, Alicia Ely Yemin. Dr. Angela Gishaga, and Dr. Gatingi Gitani. Thank you and welcome. Good morning again, everyone. So we have the uh, honor and challenge of uh, following poetry, activism, and storytellers, <laughs> and we're the wonks. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as was mentioned in the panel earlier uh, on black feminism, following the money is really important. So we will try to spice it up with, uh, with both good ideas and uh, where we think the sector ought to do, be doing better. Um, uh, we are joined by people with much expertise uh, and a lot of useful advice. Mm -hmm. On my left is Alicia Yaman, a lecturer at the Harvard Law School and senior advisor to Partners in Health, which I think many of you know was the 2005 Hilton Humanitarian Laureate. Uh, on her left, Angela Gichaga, CEO of Financing Alliance for All, for Health, sorry. Uh, and on Angela's left, uh, Dr. Gitinji Gitahi, who's the group CEO of AMREF, the 1999 Prize Laureate. So we are um, asking people to come back and sing continually for suppers. Uh, all of these people uh, have professional expertise either as medical doctors, district medical officers in their countries, uh, or in the health or the, the legal field, uh, and they all follow both healthcare delivery on the ground and policy and critically financing. So I think you'll uh, you'll hear a lot that's interesting today. We we thought we would try to take you on a three part journey. The first journey, the first part of that is a pretty impressive record for the health sector in terms of having been able to raise finance. When you think about it, the public health did not exist as a concept 150 years ago. When the Bretton Woods institutions were started at the end of World War II, no one was thinking about them funding health. They would be funding dams and roads. Uh, and, but if you fast forward, particularly pre-COVID, we, we see that the World Bank, one of its largest sectors is health. The quarter of the projects in its current pipeline are health projects, larger than any other sector, similar for USAID. A foundation like the Gates Foundation, largest in the world, has aimed its resources squarely at public health. So my, I, I come from the education sector before, uh, before Hilton, and we had our own hashtag, which was hashtag health envy. And the, they were always getting re-upped, they were always getting replenished, and it was a no-brainer, whereas other sectors struggle. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but then we'll get to the meat, I think, of their daily lives, which is how do we make this better? How do we make it more equitable? And then after that, we're going to ask them to, uh, to give their refined advice to other sectors. And we're thinking particularly of the ag sector today, since One Acre Fund is our, uh, is our laureate this year. But I think it's equally uh, important for water and for education. How can they learn from what health has done well? Mm -hmm. And how can they avoid perhaps some of the things that health might have done better? Uh, so with that, um, let me maybe start with Angela and just if you look back on say the last 50 years what was the reason that health care uh, that health attracted so much finance thank you so much and thanks for having me um, 
I may not have been physically here uh, 50 years ago, but just looking at the history of how public health and global health has been funded and the progress we have made because we have to recognize there's been progress. Um, you know, I, I do think there's a place to be said around the reframing of health as part of development. And to your point, you know, seeing some of the development banks beginning to actually significantly invest uh, and put dollars towards health in addition to infrastructure projects was really around this reframing and getting the investment case right and seeing that actually human development is part of um, um, development or in general and actually health is a cornerstone. And to some extent, education fell under that. Um, but then to the point that uh, people say is, you know, health, you know, you give an in-health intervention Ideally, in a much shorter time, you'll be able to reap the benefits and see the change in the population with health interventions. And sometimes education looks like you know, a much longer term investment. And we need to also realize that um, to the second point I wanted to talk about was there is a political economy to every economy that exists. So that's the same with health, it's the same with education and agriculture. And the political economy of health was captivated by this development institutions that was able to actually um, motivate them to, to make those kinds of investments as well. The third thing I would talk about is that we saw the role of different players and actors in health much earlier on. And so um, the role of domestic financing as well as you know, international development, as well as multilateral funding uh, and bilateral funding. Again, a lot of the health crisis we faced a number of decades ago um, really galvanized people because there was you know, intentional um, and, and evident human suffering that then galvanized a lot of narrow focus on particular diseases, which you know, a few decades ago was really needed and helps us see the progress we are seeing right now in the landscape. Uh, but again, to the second part of our conversation when we get there, um, you know, that season has come to an end and we need to kind of shift the, the, the lens we're bringing into it. Thank you, Angela. Uh, you all have seen the title of this sec session segment. Um, I think we took a bit of a risk. We called it Funding a Healthier World When Human Rights Drive Decisions. Uh, Alicia, can I ask you, uh, in, in the arc of, of health financing, how much do you think human rights have been a driver of financing and how much other factors? Uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I uh, am a senior advisor at Partners in Health. And as Peter said, Partners in Health was a laureate in 2005. Our co-founder, Paul Farmer, uh, would have had his birthday today. And I think nothing would have made him happier to see that we're having this conversation amongst friends and people who are deeply committed to change in global health and progressive change in the world. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think human rights has not always driven funding in public health. Um, Paul and Partners in Health more broadly has certainly acted to do so, has challenged the kind of colonial attitudes that low resource settings cannot operate health systems, are not capable of following patients so that they're compliant or not with, with medication re regimes, and the idea that some lives basically matter less than others' lives. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the entire ethos of our organization. Mm -hmm. But uh, the overall field of global health is, I think, remains quite top-down and quite um, driven by cost-effectiveness in a very, very narrow way. Some of what has, has driven success is that there are some medications that make you live or die, such as antiretrovirals or vaccinations. And that has expanded financing to global health, but it also has come at the cost of neglecting broader investments in health systems around the world that are really the best prevention of future pandemics as well as necessary in democratic societies to create equity and equality. Um, so, 
in some ways, human rights has, um, in fact, even been sort of used or misused to mm -hmm. say, we, the West, are telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. And there's been a backlash, certainly on at, from the uh, panel that just was here, on the way we treat uh, Uganda, for example, which has a horrific, horrific law, but the use of colonialist tropes is not necessarily helpful to making people who are suffering in embodied lives safer on the ground. Yeah, please. Peter, Peter may I add something please. to that? Just two things that Alicia has said just struck me. Um, the first one is around, um, you know, human rights and the idea that... Um, what we learned, especially even after the, during the pandemic and even now, you know, we've always talked about, you know, we are all equal, we are all human, but we actually did see uh, during the pandemic that we, we, we are all equal, but some are more equal than others, as George Orwell said, and that really eroded trust, right? And when you think about money and you think about how money flows, you know, money follows relationships and relationships are built on trust. And so when you have a situation where there is an erosion of trust, either between you know, certain geographies or to what Alicia has said, different players within the system, that then actually uh, affects how money flows and who makes the decisions around money. And then money then becomes a tool, not just to advance development, but can also be a tool to oppress. And I, th and I think that's then we need to unpack because sometimes people think about money and at attribute a characteristic to money, that money is good or bad. No, money is money. How we use money determines if that is a good instrument or it's a bad lever. So uh, uh, Alicia has pointed out that there is a tension between top-down, very broad uh, public health approaches and people-centered uh, approaches to, to health. Um, Gitinji, you have been very involved in both the nation of Kenya, other countries, and indeed Pan-African health effort. Where, where do you think health financing is in Africa today? Um, I think the first thing uh, to say, Peter, and thank you very much, and thanks for having us here, and we are proud laureates of the Hilton um, Award, so we are really proud to be here, uh, is that the notion or the assumption that human rights determines health financing is wrong. Mm. So the key driver of health financing right now, uh, we, if, if you are to look at, just look at health financing in three ways, number one is that the biggest financier of health is domestic resources. Mm -hmm. Even in, in countries where we are, it is the people, households getting money out of their pocket, uh, and they spend about 3% of their household income financing healthcare through out-of-pocket expenditure. Then the next one is actually governments that put money uh, to assist health because health, unlike agriculture, is one of those services that government actually has a is, is a you know is a big um, what you may call a duty bearer, so has to provide the services. Uh, and the final one, which is 20% or so, is what I guess we are sp we'll spend our time discussing here today, which is the organized development aid. Mm -hmm. But there's also within that organized development aid, there is philanthropy as well. So I would like to say that. For individual philanthropy, there's a feeling of human need and human rights and equity closing the gap. But for institutional money, which is the bigger one, which is close to $30 billion a year, it is actually not driven by human rights at all. It is driven by the need for global health security. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to be driven by human rights, a woman with cervical cancer would get as much attention as an individual who has tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. uh, a person who has hypertension or diabetes would get as much attention as somebody who has HIV. Mm -hmm. But no, only 2% of money in the global health architecture actually goes to non-communicable diseases. The rest of it goes to diseases that are infectious. Mm -hmm. The world, including the US here, has decided that the best thing to do is aggregate money to keep diseases at bay for global health security. And that is reflected in the way the money has been aggregated into the large, what we call the global health initiatives. The largest global health initiatives are Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, and the Global Fund for HIV, TB, and Malaria. Mm. That is where the money goes. The Global Fund is probably $4.5 billion a year of expenditure, 
and then the Global Vaccine Alliance, about $2.5 billion of expenditure. All this money largely comes from the US, but also other governments and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And all this, if you look at uh, vaccination, it is driven by the need to eliminate vaccine-preventable diseases so that you keep, you, you know, you keep them at bay. Uh, maternal health is a beneficiary of that, when we look at antenatal care and all the work that's being done around that, it is a beneficiary because it's the mother who takes the child for vaccination. So you can't just do child health and ignore the mother. But the Global Fund is all about HIV, TB, malaria. So when we had Ebola, for example, when you went to Congo DRC and you were trying to make sure that you control Ebola, the people in DRC asked, where were you when our children were dying of cholera? There's no funding for cholera. There's no funding for diarrhea. In those countries, diarrhea, where we work, because we work in that five countries, in Africa, we only work in Africa, as I'm South Africa, diarrhea and pneumonia are the largest killers. They're the biggest killers today. I mean, US and UK eliminated these things a long time ago. Then the next one is maternal mortality and the child death related to difficult labor. But the money is specifically, and if you try to shift it to address diarrhea, you people don't know. Mm. The money is for HIV, TB, and malaria. So it is not driven by, global, by human rights. It's driven by the need for global health security. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mikaji. Uh, I, think the, I think the picture is pretty vividly painted at this point, uh, but it wouldn't be a Hilton symposium if we didn't ask for solutions yes. that, that uh, are sized to meet the problem. So you're all involved in this and very committed. Um, as, as Clint said, we, we may not be the ones who get to see it totally licked, but you're doing this every day. What are the solutions that you feel are, are the most compelling and that you would invite philanthropy, the nonprofit sector, advocates to, to get involved with? So any, anyone who'd like to, please. I think, you. go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I think different players need to recognize and embrace their comparative advantage, mm. right? Um, you know, the, a dollar from philanthropy and a dollar from government and a dollar from an international development institution and a dollar from a multilateral bank, they are one dollar, but the true value of that dollar varies in how that dollar is used, right? And so philanthropy, knowing that it's a comparative advantage is, you know, in filling the gaps, in de-risking private sector entry, you know, really playing in that space and being willing to take some of being more flexible and you know offering unrestricted funds over years and I think the previous panel said you know philanthropy and, and most philanthropic entities have been in existence for a very long time doing amazing work and so you can actually play the long-term being you can actually uh, you know in, have generational investments as, as philanthropy but then also calling to a uh, front uh, other players that government has to be the steward, has to be called to task to play its role, and its role is actually in meeting some of those ongoing costs of running a system, you know, coordinating, convening um, different other sectors and also co-funding uh, within that particular sector. Again, the money that government brings in is best used in some of these running costs, not necessarily asking the government to take big investments in maybe infrastructure or, or, or other, you know, kind of one-off costs, right? Private sector is fantastic, you know. Again, we talk about public health and global health and we act that the only two players in the game are social sector and, you know, and, and the public sector. But the truth is, private sector has a role to play and they can come in with their innovation and they can come in with their efficiencies to make the entire sector work. So really people playing to their strengths and comparative advantage is huge. The second thing is around um, you know, thinking about two things. Thinking about reducing the fragmentation mm -hmm. and you know, how do we get more from what we already have in the pot, right? We do have inefficiencies. And as both of my co-panelists have mentioned, because we, we put on blinkers and we create silos, as the previous panel said, we are like, okay, no, we, we just, our only mandate is HIV. And I'm not saying it is wrong. I'm saying that now pa all patients are getting ARVs on average. And the patient who is HIV positive is not dying from opportunities, is dying from hypertension because now they're living long enough, but the health facility has been optimized to give them septrin, but has not been optimized to give them antihypertensive drugs. So you're still ending up having, uh, losing your patients, not because of the disease that you are so heavily funded for, but because of these other comorbidities. The third thing is, 
really thinking about um, the sector in terms of um, the edges. We are trying to oversimplify what is complicated and then we complicate what is very simple. We are oversimplifying the health sector and we're saying, oh, this is where health ends, this is where climate starts, this is where climate ends, this is where education starts. And the truth is, it is an entire system that we have created fake boundaries. And when we have crisis, like conflict, like pandemics, you know, these so-called boundaries are blood. So right now, when we are having conversations and advocacy um, for investments, even within health, it shouldn't be at the expense of climate. It shouldn't be as, you know, let's take the money from education and put it in health. No, actually, the question should be, what is needed for humans to thrive and then what is my role in contributing to that? And then I am clear of what my mandate is. But then the fourth thing is I go into partnership with others who have a aligned but different mandates so that we can co-invest to make the entire system thrive. We should not be pitting sectors against each other and be worrying about a narrowing window for global health because the truth is, Climate needs money, so does health, so does education. The resources are limited. How do we come together to make sure that we are actually making sure each the key components are funded? So a, a strong plea for comparative advantage, collaboration, alignment. Mm -hmm. Alicia, how about you? Um, so I would echo that, but I want to kind of zoom out and flip the frame a bit because we've been talking a lot about development aid and finance. And in reality, way more money comes from the global south to the global north than goes back in aid. Um, in reality, almost two thirds of the countries in the world to now are submerged in debt, which means in fact that 33 billion, maybe more people on this planet are living in countries where more is paid in debt servicing than to education, health, climate adaptation, anything else that is for the common good. Mm. Um, taxation. We live in a world where the top 1% have as much wealth as the bottom 76%. So those are pretty stark statistics that indicate the kinds of structural violence that we discussed earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so what can be done, what can, we, what can we learn from that? Those are the kind of structural rules that we have to fight against. And by the way, intellectual property is a massive wealth transfer from the South to the North, mm -hmm. massive. Mm -hmm. Um, as we saw during COVID, but is continuing because of resistance now from, the, from pharma. Um, so if we say that there are 3.7 to $7 trillion needed to actually meet the sustainable development goals, then we have to change those rules of the game that are rigged against the people that all of our organizations work for mm -hmm. and many of yours. Mm -hmm. And that takes a long time and concerted efforts and collaboration across fields, disciplines, borders, and comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. And yes, philanthropy has a huge role to play. We will need financing. We will need long-term investments. The aid system is obsolete. This crisis-driven charity model just does not work. We saw that during COVID. COVAX was a debacle and really, uh, eroded any kind of remaining trust there was between the, the global south and global north. Mm -hmm. And I think the pandemic accord negotiations are not helping that struggle. So I think philanthropy, like-minded philanthropies that invest for the long term, that encourage democratic voice of countries from around the world, mm -hmm. civil society participation, have a huge role to play in global health. But also, you know, as Angela just said, you can't work on comprehensive, robust health systems without addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. You can't work on health without addressing food security and food systems, or food systems without addressing climate security. They're all intertwined. We live in an era of polycrisis, and we need to start thinking and acting that way. Uh -huh. yeah. 
Let me just briefly take off the moderator hat and put on the foundation president hat. I totally agree with you that the, the foundations should be in this in a long haul vision. And you know, you, you see, we all fell into a bit of a trap here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the panel is about healthcare finance. It doesn't exclude households. It doesn't exclude national governments. Mm -hmm. But we are all so vexed by the situation of overseas development assistance that we go there. I think you've all, you know, Gitinji and Alicia, you both pointed out mm -hmm. households are the anchor of this. National yeah. governments are the second, mm. right? So let's think about the system with that basis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the way the Hilton Foundation tries to fund, knowing that local is long haul, local is actually the iceberg and not, not the part that you can see. Mm -hmm. And how can we help in our own way, but also help larger funders mm -hmm. do their jobs well? Um, if, if we can pivot right now, and let me pull you out of your, uh, maybe, maybe. Okay, I want to share some solutions as well, but you can come back to that. Okay, perfect. Well, and maybe you can slip them in this way, but I, I would like us to be able to give some advice to our colleagues from One Acre Fund. Mm. Great. Um, and which of the, the solutions, the things that give you energy and hope, uh, are applicable not only to the health sector, but also to the agriculture sector, which has even greater challenges in terms of getting funding than the health sector has had. But Gitinji, why don't we... Um... Yeah, so I could comment on that, I could actually combine. I think one of the challenges we've had with health funding is verticalization. Mm -hmm. So we finance HIV, TB, malaria, and uh, when you say now all these things need health workforce, then you're told, no, that one is not measurable because it's, you know, it's, uh, you want to measure how many people got HIV medication. Um, so that is something that every sector needs to learn, that we must break those silos of verticalization. As somebody said recently, it's not either vertical or horizontal, it is diagonal. Because you must build the institutions and policies and systems mm -hmm. for a future of, of, of self-independence. Self mm -hmm. Because aid and financing is not always going to be the solution to the challenges of people. Households want to become independent. They want to move forward. The community wants to become independent. So that's the first lesson. The second one is that reach out across sectors and work together. So one acre fund, for example, you're dealing with agriculture, reach out to health because there are outcomes within the work that one acre fund is doing that are also health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring the money together and achieve common outcomes? Mm -hmm. I went to Amsterdam Hague for a meeting of water and sanitation sector. And when I talk, they're like, oh, yeah, we can work with health. Can you imagine? What <laughs> transportation is health? But I had to go to the meeting for us. Oh, yeah, there's a relationship. So reach out more. The final thing is use philanthropy, which is now what, you know, the foundation and others are doing. Your money can be more flexible than government money. Congress needs to see how many people had HIV treatment. Mm -hmm. Your money can be, we understand the bigger problem. Let us test. Mm -hmm. Now, use philanthropy money to be the glue between the stacked financing of government, institutional, mm -hmm. and private sector. Mm -hmm. I think that, that kind of cross-cutting uh, part of philanthropy money is very important. Finally, do not duplicate government effort. Mm -hmm. Where government can contribute, let government contribute, whether it's in kind or not. Mm -hmm. So we provide healthcare across the continent for many countries, but we don't build our own hospitals. Mm -hmm. We use public health infrastructure. We use public health health workforce, what we do is connect that and make it go further, reach the unreached, maybe bring what's missing, support in leadership development, support in bringing what is not there, but we don't duplicate the public health infrastructure. Finally, let the money and the decision making go furthest and closest to where the problem is. Mm -hmm. My yeah. <laughs> Excellent agenda reporting for duty. <laughs> And uh, Alicia and, uh, uh, um, sorry, um, Angela. Yes. yes. Uh, w what would you like to, to round off on? We have about a, a minute each. Well, I, I would absolutely echo all of those pieces of advice. I, I also think that we should all be uh, wary in, in funding global health and public health, the private sector and private actors have played an outsized role, sometimes to the detriment of equity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not always um, 
it's not always appropriate for public funds to be used to de-risk so that private investments can come in because those private investments then need to be profitable. Mm. So uh, I think that that's kind of a cautionary tale from global health. Uh, and in agriculture, you know, there's more and more um, commodification and financialization as well. So I think that is is a cautionary tale. But I agree with my co-panelists fully about make decision making go as close as possible to the peoples whose lives are affected, um, and who know how what the change is that they want to see. Thank you very much. And Angela, take us home. Yes. Uh, Andrew, where are you? Andrew, I want to... I can't see you? Okay. Congratulations, Andrew and your team. Um, you know, I think you need to pause and reflect and, and just celebrate the moment. I think that's the first... Ad I think in global health, we are, you know, it's like relentless. Oh, my gosh, this new thing. New, you know, like just pause and like, okay, we've made some progress. Let's celebrate that. Uh, the second comment I'll make is, I mean, I can't add too much to what has been said here, but I would say that um, you will not always get it right, and that's okay. I, I do think that we need to... Um, leave room to, when we are afraid of the mistakes, we then don't push the envelope, right? And so I feel like in global health as well, we've been so cautionary in some areas about pushing the envelope, and so we have curtailed innovation. And so to other sectors, you know, find those partners and those uh, people who will work along with you in the journey and be willing to give you the room to innovate, to try new things, to make reasonable, well-thought-through mistakes, because it's from those mistakes that you'll continue to learn and take the sector uh, further. The last thing is don't be overwhelmed by the size of the problem. And I think the previous panel said, what's that sphere of influence? And do your absolute level best within that sphere and trust that you have other friends and partners around who will also do their level best. And that then creates a critical mass as well. Yeah, this is a struggle. Yeah. This is an ongoing struggle. It's not a winnable one-off thing. And choose your partners on this journey carefully. But it's a struggle that defines all our lives. And, and value. Our humanity, yeah. Sorry, and value community resources. Mm -hmm. Those communities you're working with are bringing in something you would otherwise have to pay for. Mm -hmm. The lived experiences, you don't have to pay for them. The land they're giving you, the land they're farming on, all those are resources you don't have to invest in. So the community is actually one of your biggest funders. Mm -hmm. Remember that. Mm. Yeah. Amen. So okay. here's to the long haul effort. I'm getting a flashing red, but I do have one uh, announcement in honor of uh, two people who have been both uh, Hilton Prize jury members and Hilton Prize board members. Those are Bill Fagey and Mark Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. Bill Fagey, you may know, is the, the architect of the eradication of smallpox, the only disease we have ever, uh, ever gotten rid of on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, they came up with something called Becoming Better Ancestors, which I think fits into the long haul. Nine lessons from the eradication of smallpox that were not so well followed on COVID. Look it up on the web, nine, the number nine lessons.org. It is curated by another Hilton uh, Prize winner, the Task Force for Global Health, but it's also very convertible into other sectors. It's not just about public health, but this is how you tackle challenges. So something produced by a, um, by a laureate. But thank you very much. Glad to be in the long haul with all of you. Thank you.